This is The High Road with author and registered psychotherapist, Dr. Marlene Bizov. Dr. Marlene speaks to the heart of people who need to be lifted up and get out of the muck and mire that often accompanies major life changes, such as divorce or separation. Dr. Marlene will aspire to help parents of divorce to love their children more than they hate their ex and to learn to take the high road. So please welcome the host of The High Road, Dr. Marlene. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. This is Dr. Marlene and you're watching The High Road on Bold Brave TV Network. My guest today is George Sally, an attorney and former family law attorney. And uh, he's been on so many times that if you are a frequent viewer of this show, I know you know him. But welcome, George. Glad to have you on again. Thank you, Dr. Merlin. Always good to be with you. I have a little bit of a spring cold, so please excuse me if I cough on occasion. That's all right. And I was just going to tell our viewers that. So I'm glad you did. What was funny was over the weekend, that was me. I didn't have much of a voice. I talked too much. You know, therapists do talk for a profession. And um, I didn't have any voice and I got mine back. And then you let me know you had voice problems. But you know what? We'll get through this show. That's for we sure. We will indeed. Uh, we're going to pick up where we left off last week on what kids need through divorce. And I had the most interesting conversation with a little gal this week who said, you guys just don't know how much it means to me that you have stopped putting me in the middle. This was to her parents, to both parents. We were all meeting and talking. And she said, you did that at one time, but you have stopped and you don't know how much it means and you don't know how much healthier my life is. And um, I took it personally. This was the takeaway message that I wanted to share with our audience. She said, I took it personally. When you put down my mom, I felt bad about myself. You put down my, my dad. I felt bad about myself. And we preach this on here all the time that kids derive their identity from their parents. So when you put down the parent, you are putting down the child as well. And this little gal who's 12, almost 13, said she definitely internalized that, was glad her parents stopped. She has, this was the key, she has a better uh, self-concept and has higher self-esteem because they've quit putting each other down. And I thought that was huge. You want to comment on that? Well, I think that's so important because if the child feels uh, estranged or as if she has to defend one or both parents, then she is more likely to seek uh, validation outside of her parents, outside of the family. And that may not always be validation that the parents agree with. Right. Right. That's right. And you are absolutely right. That's such a good point that kids will do that. They will find surrogate parents or surrogate families, or it will just be their friends. They go to their friends and that's not always, you know, your parents might like your friends. Your parents might not like your friends. I mean, that might not, like you said, be a good resource. Right. And and so the parents allow the child to be um, released from having to defend one or both parents against the other uh, by loving their children more than they hate their ex. Yes. Yes. And thank you for getting that in there. But it's so true. You that's the key. You have to love your children more than you hate your ex. And unfortunately, some people, some parents don't discover the harm that is done until it's too late. And and that's unfortunate because that's when we see adolescents who have all kinds of problems, whether it's drugs, whether it's affiliations with gangs, uh, whatever the case may be, they're almost driven to that surrogacy 
because the parents have, have uh, forced them away from themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. Yeah. Um, I know we didn't get through our list last week. Um, I believe that I'm not positive, but I believe we did talk about the kids are not your confidants, but I had something else happen this week. Funny, the things that happen in the course of a week when you have a certain topic that you're in the middle of. But um, I had a parent burden her child, again, a daughter, with using her as her confidant. And finally, the child, 16 years old, um, riding in my car with me, said, would you, which I won't go into why she was in my car with me. That's not that unusual, but it's not that common. But this girl was. And she said, can you get my mom to stop talking to me? I don't want to hear it. She's got to find a friend to talk to you, but not me. Well, I so, think that's a perfect yeah. illustration of why counseling is so critical for parents yes. going through divorce or separation. It really is. We talk about this all the time, but they don't know what they don't know. Right, right. But the, the opportunity to have a confidant in a counselor or a therapist and also receive the education component of counseling or therapy uh, is invaluable and uh, usually will educate the parent uh, as to what they are doing to their child or children by forcing them into a peer type of a relationship. Right, right. And what I see a lot is this same parent who has become a peer, like you said, to their child, then tries to shift into parent role. And that doesn't work very well. Your kids aren't going to let you vacillate back and forth between being my buddy when you need me, but being my parent when you don't like something I'm doing. Absolutely. And, and the child almost intuitively knows that the parent can't have it both ways. Right, right. They do. And then, like you said, the education piece of counseling, teaching them things like what I said a few minutes ago, that children derive their identity from their parents. And when you put them down, put the parent down, you're putting the child down. You're chipping away at their self-esteem and adolescents especially have enough self-esteem problems as it is that we don't need to add to it. No. And, and I have seen parents uh, behave admirably and not put down the other parent in the presence of the child, uh, whether it's through body language or sighing or, or language selection or just outright uh, denigration of that parent and the children are healthier uh, they're more secure uh, they're happier they don't seem to go through uh, depressive episodes and uh, the parents are to be commended for that yes yes I love telling the story that I know I've told on here before but when my son was about seven or eight maybe even younger than that. I don't remember exactly, but he was in his room with a friend who was over for a play date. And I was on the phone to his dad for a few minutes and his friend said, who's your mom talking to? And he said, my dad. And he goes, Oh, they can talk to each other. And my son said, yeah, my mom and dad are best friends. <laughs> and that, of course, was not true. Um, we were friends, but we were not best friends by any means. But what a beautiful thing to have a child of divorce think that his parents are best friends. Yeah, absolutely. And, and how secure that makes that child feel. Yes, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> um, there was one other that I was going to... Oh, yes, this was the other one. So um, I don't know how much our audience knows about the court system, probably a lot, uh, but we do get contempt motions. And um, I occasionally have to go to those, as you know, you always have to go, but I occasionally have to go. And I went to one this last week 
and the parent was sent to jail for being in contempt. Um, and the two children who are nine and 13 um, were not told in age appropriate terms what happened. We had agreed that, and when I say we, I mean the judge, the parent who didn't go to jail and myself agreed that I was going to talk to these kids and tell them what was going on in age appropriate terms. So not say your dad's going to jail or he's in jail, but just say he's got some stuff he's got to take care of, you know, age appropriate things. And again, parents can go to counseling to learn those age appropriate things. But what happened is he got to the jail and happened to call them and on caller ID, it showed up on the oldest girl's phone, El Paso County Jail. Uh, so she knew right then, dad's in jail. He's calling me from the jail. He was also crying. He was saying, I'm not going to see you for a while. And I can't emphasize enough the importance of telling kids whatever it is, whether it's we're getting a divorce, mom is moving out, dad is moving out, whatever it is, you have to tell them in age appropriate terms. Well, and I don't think we're suggesting that it's easy because the parents no. can be threatened. They, they feel very threatened. They can be extremely angry. So raising their behavior to a higher level, it's, it's not easy. And to have the right. support system of a, a counselor or a therapist, again, is invaluable because it is not easy and they have someone who can both give them perspective uh, as well as some affirmation. Yes, exactly. And, you know, parents don't by nature know how to do that often. We're not taught how to go through divorce in a no. healthy way. And so no one thinks they're going to go through divorce. You know, when you go for premarital counseling, and I've thought about this because I've done some of the premarital counseling for my church. And I thought we really need to kind of address if this doesn't work, let's tell you some things to help you take the high road. But you don't want to go into premarital counseling with stuff like that. And yet people really do need to know because by the time they seek out a counselor, often the damage is already done. Uh, that, that's true. And when they're wildly in love, uh, they're sort of in denial. Well, that'll never happen to us. Right. So even if you addressed it, they probably wouldn't listen very well. <laughs> no, I agree yes. with that. Yes. And again, most jurisdictions that I know of do require that parents go to a co-parenting class. That is something that I also teach for our courts. But again, by that time, too many mistakes have been made. In fact, last week I taught the class and I saw a guy a couple of times shaking his head, you know, when I suggested some of you might have already made this mistake and he's shaking his head and nodding and then came up and talked to me afterwards and said, I wish I would have had this just a couple of weeks earlier. So, yeah, I think a lot of times the damage starts before the case is filed and yes. it's been going on just like the damage to the marriage itself. It's been going on for some time before the actual legal proceedings are commenced. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Yep. All right. Let me see what we didn't get to last week. Um, oh, this is a big one. And that's why when we didn't get done last week, I'm like, I don't care if it's this week or some other week, but we have to finish this list. Because um, for our viewers benefit, I'm, I made you helped also uh, identify some talking points. And so I have a little list and not addressing all of these would be a travesty. I mean, we'd be doing you guys a disservice, but this one is a good one. They should, your children should never feel like they're placed in a position to have to choose between their parents. You want to talk about that? And then I'll tell a story from actually yesterday. 
Well, I, I agree with that. And too often, a parent recruits the child to be his or her confidant and his or her witness or to attest to what the parent claims is the bad behavior of the other parent. And that, of course, compromises the child and doesn't really allow the child to be a child. It tends to parentify the child. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, it does. Um, so I had a couple in yesterday. Yes, it was Sunday. Yes, I was working. Um, but the parents, one parent, wants to move to a different country. So you and I have talked before with the, our, our audience about um, relocation cases to me are win-lose cases. You've got a winner and you've got a loser because someone's going to have the child during the academic school year and someone's going to have the summer. Right. And in this case, one parent wants to move to a complete different country. And you talk about a kid who feels like they have to choose. And we actually haven't talked to her yet, but that was what I talked to the parents about is we need to get her input. She's old enough, nine going on 10. Um, she's old enough to have input, not too much say so, but input. But I said, man, you guys are gonna make her choose. And in right. essence, that's, yeah. Don't you think that's what relocation <coughs> cases boil down to is a child's got to choose. I mean, we can decide for them, but if we're gonna get their input, we're basically asking them to choose. Well, and it's not just the threat of a perception of loss of one of the parents. They're potentially losing everything that's familiar to them. Friends, yes. um, every playmates, uh, schoolmates, school matriculation, uh, their whole world is exploding. Yes, clubs and sports groups and teams, things like that. Um, social capital for our audience is what you and I know that as. Right. Um, they, they lose all their social capital, N even knowing where the library is. That was one of the first things I wanted to learn when I moved to Colorado many, 27 years ago, oh, 28 years ago now. Um, my apartment that I got when I first moved out here was actually right next to one of the library branches because I wanted to be close to a library and I wanted to know where it was, where my son's elementary school was going to be, things like that, you know. Right. But and that's all social child, capital. Mm -hmm. that, that's their whole world. And as they yes. age, their circle of friends becomes ever increasingly important. And yes. so the potential of loss there is so great. Well, it is. And I'm glad you brought that up because people often ask me and there is no one answer to this, but they'll say, is it harder on younger kids or older kids? And I have to tell you my experience and I believe the research supports that it's harder on the older kids when their whole world changes, because like you said, friends are more important. So if you relocate a teenager out of their friend group, their peer group, that's going to be much more difficult than an elementary school age right. child. Yeah, um, I agree. Yeah. And they just, it tends to rock their whole world. They've had this world for 13, 14, 15, 16 years, whereas a four-year-old or a six-year-old can adjust more easily. Well, and, and I think the, the, the teenager actually can end up presenting the parent who's presenting that choice or causing that choice to have to be made. That's yes, very that's difficult right. and can cause quite a schism between the parent who is seeking to relocate like that and the child where the child actually resents the parent for that. Right. Yeah. And that's why as they get older, I do let them have input and the more, input the older they are but um, it's just awful when you have to make them in essence choose right right yeah and i i know we've talked about this on here before but especially teenagers and really starting at about 11 or 12 are in the adolescent stage of development 
And one of their tasks is individuation and separation, becoming their own person, separating from their parents. And as you pointed out, their friend group becomes most important. And so when you take those developmental needs into account, plus we can't forget the gender identification need because kids in the adolescent stage will definitely gravitate toward the same gender parent. And, and so, yeah, go it's, ahead. Been, it's been interesting to me to see nine, 10, 11 year olds and their peer group that they engage with in sports, particularly mm -hmm. uh, a little bit later, um, honor clubs and things of that nature, but it starts relatively early. It does. And actually, we need to take a break, but we will pick up with this conversation when we come back. This is Dr. Marlene. You're watching The High Road on Bold Brave TV Network. We'll be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to EasySense.com and learn how, with your help, we can fight these horrific brain disorders. That's EasySense.com to learn more and help support the Broderick Foundation. Author, radio show host, and coach, John M. Hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Welcome back. This is Dr. Marlene, and you're watching The High Road on Bold Brave TV Network. My guest today is George Sally. Once again, you're almost a resident guest. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's always a pleasure to be with you, Dr. Marlene. Oh, it's always great to have you. You have such great input and we think alike. And that helps me also. Um, not everyone does, but you know, you and I have been around a long time. And so um, I think once somebody spends a few years in the courts and with divorcing parents, you get to see how things really are. Whereas younger attorneys or younger mental health professionals, nothing against youth, but when they don't have much experience, I'm like, boy, you've not had a case where the court ruled on that topic, have you? Because they will have a different view or a different thought about what's gonna happen. I think there's no substitute for experience and we get to see the results over time of how that child becomes an adult and how the impact of their parents' divorce forms them as an adult or, or helps to form them as an adult. Yes, yes, for sure. Before we went to break, we were talking about friends um, becoming more important than, or, you know, uh, the friend relationship being more important the older kids get. Right. Um, and I don't know the comment or the point you were making right before we went to break, 
do you even remember? I'm sorry, George, I'm putting you on the spot. Yes, no, that's perfectly all right. I think that once the children become adolescents and, and teens and later teens, uh, forcing them to choose between maintaining their circle of friends and their affiliations, their school and so forth, can actually cause a schism between them and the parent who they feel is putting them in that position or forcing them to make that kind of a choice. Right. And often, whatever, in fact, I'm thinking even with this little, she's going to be 10 by the time we talk to her and it's actually mom that wants to relocate out of the country. Um, my guess is she's very likely going to choose friends and ball team. And I'm not sure what all she does. I don't remember right now. I don't know that we got into that yesterday, but very likely going to want to maintain her social capital here of school and friends and activities and all of that and may well choose that over being with mom, even though, and this is where there's kind of a discrepancy between needs, because as she gets older, she's probably going to have a need for that gender identification with mom, the same gender parent. And yet my guess is she's not going to want to leave everything she has here. Right. Yeah, I think that's true. And forcing a child into that choice it's really they don't feel that they have a choice they feel like yeah. it's being imposed upon them uh and they don't have a choice they feel a sense of powerlessness which doesn't yes. help either well and like dad pointed out yesterday he said this is a lose-lose you know mm -hmm. he just couldn't see the win in it and i can't say i blame him i mean i understand why mom wants to go um but i do get that too the more parents can try to stay close to their children. One of the videos that we show during the level one class that I teach downtown, um, one of the kids says, I just wish my dad would move closer to us. And the more parents can stay in the same vicinity, your children benefit from that for sure. Well, it's easy, I guess, for us to say this, but I think it is easier for a parent to make a choice about specifically job relocation than it is for a child to make a choice between their parents where they want to live. Right, right. Yes, that's a good point. Why do we force kids to make choices instead of us making the choice that benefits them? Right, and, and yeah. so the parent does not recognize the implications of the choice that they're making because they're pretty self-absorbed right at the moment. Right. Uh, but the impact on the child is, is almost greater than the impact of the job relocation. Right. Well, in fact, another family, I had another family in yesterday and the dad in that case told me he just took a new job where he won't have to travel. He is going to make less money, considerably less. And he was worried about that and what the court would think, you know, if they would think he was voluntarily underemployed. And I said, if it means more to you that you don't travel and you're here for your kids, that's the right choice, regardless of how the court might view that. Right. Is the court is not always uh, extremely sensitive. The court is, tends to be mechanical about those things. Yes, legalistic. Yes, 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 very much so. Yes, and I told him that too. I said, when it comes to figuring child support, is that possibly going to hurt you? Possibly. But your kids are going to benefit. So weigh that out. And he said, oh, no question. I want to be here for my kids. Right, and that's, that's the right answer, but it's not always an easy answer. No, no, because I'm sure he is going to take a hit, you know, but yeah. it is what it is. I do think courts are getting better about understanding the needs of children. And I try to explain to parents, well, the relocation out of country. I tried to explain to dad, the court cannot tell mom she can't go. And he struggled with that. He's like, what? And I said, 
they can't tell you as adults where to live. They only no. have jurisdiction over your child. Right. And he had no idea until I told him. I guess his attorney, well, I don't know that he has re-engaged his attorney, but he did not know that. And so the court, it isn't that they don't care about the needs of children, but they can't, I'm sure they would love to tell mother, no, you can't move. You have to stay here. Your child is better off with both of you here, but they legally can't tell her she can't move. No, and, and unfortunately, courts a lot of times tend to equate economic progress or benefit of the parent with benefit to the child as if it outweighs all these other considerations of their peer groups and affiliations, their maturation process, uh, their, their uh, bonding to the parents and so forth. And that's not always the case, but the courts tend to be uh, legalistic, as you've said, mechanical. It's a numbers game. Uh, and that's, that's very unfortunate. Yes, it sure is. It sure is. Um, like I said, I do believe they're getting better at recognizing the needs of children. But I definitely think that needs to be a, a stronger aspect or consideration of what the court does. Well, I understand they have to follow the statute. Yeah, I, I think there's no question about it. But and and so a parent, unfortunately, can be put into a a win lose type of situation where economically they're forced into a lose type position. But if they win for the lifetime of their child, uh, it's justifiable. Yes, I agree a hundred percent. All right, let me see what's next on our list. Oh, George, this is one you and I have talked about before. <clears throat> and I think maybe even on here, but it bears repeating. Parents often exhibit subtle behaviors, thinking the kids don't notice. And then they'll say, I have never said anything bad about the other parent to my child. But they roll their eyes. They look the other way. They go, things like that and just their body language, their tense and their, you know, gritting their teeth or whatever. You want to speak to that because you and well, I know kids pick up on that. Not only that, but, but friends and extended family think they're being supportive by displaying those behaviors without recognizing the impact on the children. And if the children are present as they often are, mm -hmm. uh, then that damage accrues to the child without, and the parent doesn't have to be a participant. The parent can right. be an observer, but the parent has the obligation and responsibility to quash those types of behaviors in friends and family and tell them, educate them that I understand you're trying to be supportive of me and you think my ex is a jerk, but uh, that's not appropriate to convey that to my children. Right. And that's a great point you bring up that the courts do expect you parents out there going through this to manage your environment. They expect you to do exactly what George just said and stop that well-meaning friend, relative, neighbor, coworker who walks in and thinking you want to hear something negative about your ex says it right in front of the children never realizing that that's damaging to your child. You have to address that, like George just said. Right, and the scope of responsibility for parents, if they are going to take the high road, if they are going to have a more healthful child as they raise that child or participate in the raising of the child, they have to assume that responsibility, which they are often unaware of. Yes. Yes, and they don't want to offend a well-meaning friend. But you right. know what? Your friend will understand or they'll get over it or they're not your friend. But regardless, you've got to take care of your kids. Right, right. And that comes first. Yes. And I just can't believe how many parents over the years, while I sit there in my office and watch them react facially to the other parent, mention of the other parent, but they'll say, I've never said a negative thing in front of my kids or at all about that parent. And it's like, you don't have to. 
your body language, facial expression, eye rolling, sighing, does all of that for you. And I have seen adult friends and extended family who do have an awareness of their behaviors and the impact on the children. And it is rewarding to see them refrain from engaging in those behaviors that show disdain for the other parent. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And like you were saying about taking the high road, which is the whole point of this show, that's really what we are called to do on behalf of our children is take the high road, be the parent who protects your child and be the parent who loves your child more than you hate your ex. Right. Um, right. And, easier and said than done. But. It's apparent when, when friends and family are engaging in inappropriate behavior or appropriate behavior. It's, it's very apparent. And so if it's apparent to a third party observer, it must be very apparent to a child. Right. Because they're little sponges and they pick up on everything they see and hear around them. True. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. Let me see what else. Oh, this is a little thing, but well, not really. <laughs> I mean, it's a minor a detail, um, but it's one of my pet peeves. When children are with the other parent, it is up to the parent to do the calling. So if you're going to have a phone call with your child, you're the adult, you're the parent, you call your child. Now, you might call them if they're younger on the other parent's phone. And you might say, I don't like calling the other parent's phone. They're going to answer and say a comment or two that I don't want to hear or don't like. But too bad. You need to call them. I have parents who say, no, I want my children to call me. But then they get upset when they don't. Well, kids are kids. And if they're in the middle of a video game, TV show, playing with their friends, whatever, they're not going to stop and call you. And so I think it's it's on the level of of their stuff going back and forth with children. Yes. Their stuff needs to go with their children and the parent needs to be aware of that and encourage uh, their stuff going back and forth. Uh, encourage the parents to take responsibility for the communication. What time do you want me to pick him up? What time do you want me to pick her up? Uh, when will you be finished with whatever uh, celebration or observation is, is going on. The parents need to be the parents in that regard and, and putting the mm -hmm. children in that position is as inappropriate as trying to play tug of war with their stuff. Right, exactly. And like I said, that's the role of a parent, of an adult. You don't place that on your child. And I mean, you can always request that when the other parent sees that it's your call coming in, that they hand the phone to the child. But let's grow up and be able to at least say, hello, let me get Bobby or Susie or, you know, whoever the kids are. And again, this is not easy for parents, but no. parenting, nobody said parenting was easy in general. No, that's right. That's right. And we understand that there's a lot of hurt, anger, resentment, maybe betrayal that you're feeling. And it's not easy to set that aside. But again, your job, your role is to meet the needs of your child. Right. And, and I've heard parents use and, and extended family use derogatory nicknames for yes. a former spouse and things of that nature. And thinking that maybe they're too sophisticated for the child to pick up on that, but they're not too sophisticated for the child to pick up on that. No. And this is even worse. And I'm glad you brought that up because it made me think of this. And this is really a message to our parents out there. I have had numerous parents, this isn't once or twice, put in their phone a derogatory name for that other parent, like idiot, or, you know, I don't want to swear on this show, so I won't say some of the other things, but the B word or whatever, but some derogatory name 
for that other parent on in their phone. And then when that parent calls and you hand the phone to the child, they see that. And it, and it sets a tone. There's no question yes. about it. Yes. Oh, you think my dad's an idiot. You think my mom's a bee, you know, whatever it may right. be. But how horrible. Again, let's grow up. Yeah. And, and putting the child in that position is just, it's so inappropriate and it's so damaging and the damage is lasting. It is. It is. Kids will carry that into adulthood. And as we've talked about before and mark my words, I always tell parents, mark my words because they won't think so now, but I guarantee you that child is going to resent you later on. And, and I have heard parents equate the behavior of their adult or near adult children with their ex when they're dissatisfied with how that adult or near adult child is behaving. Mm -hmm. And they say, oh, well, he or she is just uh, imitating or, or indicating the same behavior as my ex did or mm -hmm. his mom or her, her dad. And uh, yep. it's really like you're acting just like your mom or yes. just like your dad. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. You and I see that, don't we? We do. And it's and it's lasting it, it, and it, it is, is damaging to those adult or near adult children, just as some of the behaviors we've talked about are damaging to a younger child. Right. And I think I shared this on here before, but again, it bears repeating the gal I do the the attorney that I do the level one class with, she always says, fast forward, you know what, I, I'm going to hold this thought because I think you and I are going to want to have discussion about it. And we're going to take another break here in less than 30 seconds. So I'm going to hold this thought, but we'll come back to it when we come back. Um, but we're going to take another break. This is Dr. Marlene. You're watching The High Road on Bold Brave TV Network. We'll be right back. subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating. Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. Be magical. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, hope, and support for caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. Welcome back. This is Dr. Marlene, and you're watching The High Road on Bold Brave TV Network. My guest is George Sally, attorney and um, frequent guest on this show. But George, right before we went to break, we were talking about um, the attorney that I do the level class, level one class with downtown. And let me explain to the audience. I know you know, but they don't know. Level one class is for every parent going through a divorce that has a child. So even if you agree 100% on your parenting plan, 
um, you still have to take this just so you understand the needs of children of divorce. But my counterpart always says, imagine yourself sitting around the table 20 years from now. And what do you want your children to look back and say to you about this time? Do you want them to say, thank you. Thank you for keeping me out of the middle of your conflict. Thank you for not making me choose between my parents. Thank you for not communicating through me, not making me your messenger. Or are they going to say, why? Why did you have to put me through that? Why did you have to tear us apart and make us feel like we had to choose? And, you know, it, it's such a good point. It's a point well made. It's a great representation, very creditable to that attorney for pointing that out, because oftentimes yes. we don't focus on that. We focus on the immediacy of what the client wants, uh, regardless of the impact or the potential impact long term on children. It's a win lose type of a dynamic, and they expect the attorney to seek out what they consider to be winning. Right, right. And some are truly in it for the fight. This is win, lose, and I'm going to win. And it's a fight. It's a battle. And I'm determined to win. Yes, absolutely. And, and there's no question. And, and we are very clear in our understanding that that is what the client wants out of the attorney client relationship. Someone yes. who's going to fight and fight continuously for what they want regardless of the implications uh, long term or on the children. They want to win. They want what they want and they want the attorney to seek that out continuously uh, and unfailingly. And so we really don't have the opportunity oftentimes to counsel with them as to the long term cost of what it is that they are seeking or demanding of us. Right. Well, and how can you, I mean, even in the sometimes extensive time you have with your client, how can you explain all of that stuff to them? The long-term implications for their children. I mean, it's just almost impossible. Well, it, it is. And again, it's one of the reasons why I'm such a fan of some counseling uh, or therapy going on coincident to the divorce process. Right. Right. And I even often tell parents, because you know the stigma that counseling, at least traditionally, has had. You know, people are embarrassed to go to counseling. I'll even tell them, if you want to come in for some parent, co-parent education, you know, and frame it that way. Anything that gets them to come in and learn what they don't know is beneficial. Absolutely. And of course, there's a financial consideration. Counselors don't work for free any more than attorneys do. That's Correct. how they make a living. And so there is a financial component, uh, but it is so worth it in the long run for their relationship with their children. Yes. Yes. And speaking of cost, to that point, a lot of people don't realize that things like co-parenting counseling, even though they call it counseling, it's relational counseling. It's not someone with a major mental health diagnosis like depression or bipolar or PTSD. It's relational. So co-parenting counseling, reunification counseling, those things are typically not covered by insurance. But I can speak for myself that I do reduce my fee when people are paying out of pocket. And to me, there's just no excuse for people not to get that service because it will benefit them much more than whatever they're paying. Yeah, I, I think that's true. And, and unfortunately, people have to play the insurance game about yep. whether or not there's a medical necessity for some counseling or some action. And uh, uh, not all insurances are available to cover to provide coverage, uh, but they, that's one of the immediate things that people should explore is whether or not they have that type of coverage. Right, right. And like I said, I can't speak for other therapists, but I know I work with people. I reduce my fee because insurance won't pay. 
And I understand that's a cost. But then I see other things that I hate to say this because I'm not trying to be judgmental of our parents, but I see the other things they spend their money on and the silly, stupid things that they will fight about and spend their money to fight about them. And I'm like, no, you'd be much better off coming in for this education or counseling if you need to vent or whatever than fighting about whatever you're fighting about. Well, not only that, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a protracted relationship where the counseling goes on week in and week out for months. Uh, right. There is benefit to be uh, received from just a few sessions if that's all they can afford. Right. Yes. It doesn't have to be weeks and weeks, but once or twice or take a class. You know, our classes are actually pretty affordable. Right. Right. Yeah. And the benefit far outweighs that cost. Well, it is so hard to believe how quickly our time goes by, but we are about out of time again. So thank you so much again, George. George Sally has been my guest today. We'll have you back for sure, but thanks for being here. My pleasure to be here, Dr. Marlene. Thank you for having me. You bet. You've been watching, I am Dr. Marlene. You've been watching The High Road on Bold Brave TV Network. We'll see you next week. Tune in to The High Road with host Dr. Marlene and gain insight into how to rise above tough circumstances and learn the skills that will help you take the high road in your life, no matter what challenges might come your way on the next episode of The High Road.